everyone, today I will be talking about mercury vapour lamps. In a little while I will be conducting a small experiment with one and show you how they work. Then later on I will explain the history of them, what they were used for and I will also be showing you a number of these lamps far and up. Here I have some very interesting collections. This one is a 50 watt and that one is an 80 watt. I'll get them out of the packaging for you to just see. Now you can see the difference in the sizes. This one is made by Philips and it's a 125 watt. As you can see, the base of it is a bayonet cap with three pins and they're also available in 80 watts too. I will explain more about this one later on. And here I have one that is clear, which is 80 watts. The arc tube in these mercury lamps are made out of a special type of quartz glass and that quartz glass allows the shortwave ultraviolet radiation to escape whilst the outer glass case on the bulb is made out of a borosilicate glass which is designed to block the shortwave ultraviolet radiation. Needless to say, if you are in close proximity to this lamp you should wear protective eyewear as these uncoated lamps do emit very high levels of long wave ultraviolet radiation because there is no phosphorus to absorb it. Always remember that ultraviolet radiation is not good for your eyes thus prolonged exposure to it may cause some degree of eye damage therefore it would be wise to wear a set of these. However, this one with the dark shades would offer more protection as it's specially made for gas arc welding and is designed to block both the intense infrared and ultraviolet radiation. Although, if you do not have a set of protective eyewears, then I would strongly recommend standing at least 60 feet away from this bulb. Remember, your eyes are very delicate, and it's always better to be overcautious than undercautious. Anyways, here I have a ballast fixed to a wooden board, and if you do this, make sure you leave a small gap, like this, because these ballasts do get very, very hot, and it may even scorch it. The great thing I love about these mercury lamps is they require very little control gear unlike sodium ones require igniters and capacitors. All that a mercury lamp requires is just a simple ballast and a capacitor. In fact, you can even run one without a capacitor. These bulbs work similar to that of fluorescent lighting where a starter lamp strikes the tube. The only difference between them is the starter lamps are built inside mercury lamps and it is linked to that metal rod. It's that little black thing. This white thing is a connector block which supplies power to the ballast. To the left is a dimmer switch, which is part of this experiment. Then to the right of that is the socket that supplies power to the lamp. And this is the wiring. Red is for live, positive. The black is the neutral or negative. And finally the green is the earth. But if you live in America it's known as the ground wire. This is my E27 base adapter for the mercury lamp. These bayonet lamp holders are more popular in England and Australia and it's just more convenient for me to use these lamp adapters rather than to keep one up different lamp holders. All the Ellison screw bulbs are made in Europe but most of them are now made in Hungary and I must say they make pretty good lamps. The funny thing about these European ones is they're all designed to fit in any old standard E27 base lamp holder. Now you must always remember that mercury vapour lamps are negative resistance and always require a ballast. If you were to run one of these bulbs directly off the mains, the arc tube will draw so much power that it will just self-destruct which could result in an explosion. <laughs> Unless they're self ballast ones like this one I'm showing you now, which has two pins and is designed to fit in any two pin bayonet lamp holder. Now this bulb was made by Crompton, which I believe is a very old English company. Anyhow, the way these self ballast lamp works is inside the bulb there is a very thin wire and what it does is regulates the flow of electricity going to the arc tube. And that is exactly what this ballast is designed to do. If I were to remove that outer metal casing, you will find a coil of wires similar to the one on this dimmer switch. Their job is to regulate the flow of electricity. 
Of course, in order for it to work successfully, they would have to be insulated with a special type of heat resistant varnish, otherwise the electricity would just simply short across them. OK, I am now going to conduct a small experiment which I spoke to you earlier on. I am now connecting the lamp to the unit by the adapters, lamp holders to the socket. I am running this bulb off that dim switch. At first I thought this experiment was never going to work, but it did. Now that is a pretty colour. Normally it will only stay this colour for a few seconds, but the dimmer switch is preventing the lamp from receiving more power. It's basically an underpower bulb. Although I don't think it's a good idea to do this for too long because I think eventually it may cause problems to the lamp or it may cause the arc tube to blacken. Now you can see the arc tube is emitting a blue light. This is called ultraviolet radiation. The reason why the outside of the lamp looks pink is because the outer casing of the bulb is coated in a phosphorus paint which is designed to convert some proportions of ultraviolet emissions, mainly the rich blue rays, into red light. As I increase the power, the lamp is emitting more of a whitish purple light, and after about five minutes it will shine bright white. It's a bit like um, looking at a set of coloured lights at a disco party, and if they're blue, green and red ones shining on the floor, as you can see in this diagram, it will make the floor appear white. Well, the principle is the same with mercury lamps, where you have the blue and green light that represents the arc tube, and the red light that represents the phosphorus. In fact, um, more light is generated from the phosphorus than the actual arc tube. This is why coated ones are more favourable over clear ones. Believe it or not, these lamps have been around a very long time. They were first invented in 1901, and back then they would have been clear glass ones, just like this one. OK, I am now going to fire this uncoated lamp up. As you can see, the lamp looks very blue, but once it is powered up, it will emit a very bright silver coloured light with a slight bluish green hue although it will make everything around it appear green. The colour rending index on these lamps is so poor that's why you rarely see them used in road lighting. This book belonged to my great grandparents and I think it was published back in the early 1920s. In it, it mentions mercury vapour lamps, which I've highlighted it in green. And it says they were used for treating people with certain illnesses like rickets or vitamin D deficiency due to their ultraviolet rays. On this page, there are children undergoing treatment under these lamps. Because the colour rendering index from these lamps is so poor, in the 1950s, manufacturers began coating them with phosphorus in order to counteract this problem. This one here is one of the very first generation of the colour correction bulbs to be used for road lighting. The base on this lamp is a bayonet type with three pins. You are probably wondering why it has three pins. The answer is, back in the past, the majority of road lighting fixtures ran incandescent light bulbs. And this was to prevent the lighting engineers from accidentally running these on incandescent fixtures. And there's no way this bulb is going to fit in that lamp holder. These three pin bayonet ones are used in those type of lighting fixtures. 
These are the old Thorn Beta 9s. I remember these from when I was a kid. They used to light up our side streets where I used to live. I was told they were first installed on our road back in the early 1960s. What I liked about these ones was they didn't cause any light pollution which leads to sky glow at night time. Because the bulbs were tucked inside the aluminium shell. The posts are made of concrete which were very popular in the 1950s and 60s. Unfortunately the road lighting engineers are no longer allowed to install these types of lamp posts due to the road safety crash test. Those old lighting fixtures are controlled by a timer switch which is located on the bottom part of the lamp post where the metal door is. That is the timer switch and control gear. which turns the lamp on at dusk and off at dawn. This is an old Thorn Beta 7. That one is an old vintage mercury lamp fixture, probably installed in the early 1950s. Sadly, many of those old road lighting fixtures are now being replaced by those new compact fluorescent ones. which run these types of bulbs. They don't last as long as the old mercury vapoured lamps. The average burning life of these bulbs is roughly 24,000 hours, although the only problem with them is they do tend to lose luminosity. For example, the bulb to the right has exceeded its burning life of 24,000 hours. As you can see, it's emitting a dull greenish grey light and it's not as half as bright compared to the one on the left, which is brand new. What causes this loss of luminosity is due to blackening of the arc tubes. Now, a bulb that suffers from blackened arc tubes doesn't necessarily mean to say that it is approaching the end of its life. In fact, they can carry on burning for much longer and sometimes this can also happen to newly manufactured bulbs. The only problem is they become very, very inefficient whilst drawing the same amount of power and only emitting half the amount of light. On this bulb, I'll just focus it up to the camera, hang on. You can see where the arc tube has blackened somewhat. And compare it to this one, where the arc tube is clear. Also, some newly manufactured lamps may emit a slightly pinky hue. However, after a thousand hours burning life, the lamp will lose that pinky hue and look more natural white. Did you know they were also used in light beacons on top of traffic islands? Although many of them are now being replaced by LED lamps. Okay, I'm now going to fire these two lighting fixtures up. The lights reflected off the window is the true colour of the Merc lamps because the ones you see directly kind of messes up the colour balance on the video camera, or I think it's called the white balance. And by doing this, it just saves me using a lens filter. 
the fixture on the top has an old lamp that has been used quite a lot and yes it does suffer from a blackened arc tube the one down on the bottom has rarely been used at all the one with the blackened arc tube is emitting a bluish green light whilst the one that's never been used looks a mauvey purple colour once both these lamps are fully powered up the one that's hardly been used will emit a pure brilliant white light with a slightly pinky tinge and it'll put the other one to shame it'll make it look a dull greenish grey colour Well the lamps are almost reached their full brightness but uh, that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed and please feel free to comment, rate and subscribe. And thank you very much for watching.